All right. Looks like we had a few more folks join. So we're going to go ahead and get started. A quick disclosure today. This is not a research report or investment advice. All opinions expressed in this webinar are those of our presenters and past performance is not indicative of future results. So welcome everybody to our Q2 2024 financial performance webinar. Before we get started, our speakers today are Ryan Frazier, our CEO and co-founder, Cameron Wu, our VP of Investments, Jake P, our Head of Operations, and myself, Corinne Headland, and I lead our investor relations team. Uh, I also want to mention we have a whole host of folks you'll see in chat today from the Arrive team that will be helping answer your questions, taking in all the feedback, so on and so forth. So without further ado, I would love to welcome Cameron up to the stage here. This is a brief agenda. Before we go there, we'll walk through Q2 2024 highlights, individual properties, fund investments, dividends, share price, roadmap and Q&A. So Cameron, I'll kick it over to you. All right. Thanks, Corinne. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. So I'm primarily going to go through our portfolio, high-level operating metrics, some headline numbers, and then I'll hand it over to Jake for some meat and potatoes of financial performance. All right. So we have crossed the 400 property um, Mark, for our individual offering. So thank you, everybody, for participating in all of the investments. It's been a wild ride. So thank you. Uh, thank you again. $172 million of property value funded across 62 markets. And then with our SFR fund, we are up to 39 properties. And here is a quick glimpse of our spread. And when you look at this map and you and you think about 400 individual properties, 39 in the fund with this kind of spread, really highlights our investment strategy and how we've chosen to structure our operating model. Some investment companies, they go really dense into a couple of markets and they kind of vertically integrate there. We've decentralized a lot of our operations, but the benefit of that is we've gotten to be very selective where we've purchased investments over time and we get to shift strategies um, really quickly and agilely. So, you know, this really shows that we're able to pick the best investments that we see in our 62 markets that we participate in. Uh, so this map, I thought, was a good illustration of that conscientious strategy. OK, on individual single family residential leasing. So we had a pretty nice quarter two. We had 92.5% stabilized occupancy um, as an average. So at any given point in time in those three months, we were 92.5% occupied on average. We had 72 new leases starting in quarter two with a 20 month average lease term. So the our, our standard is a two year lease, but we also stagger our leases to have ideal expirations. So most of our expirations are between February and June. And that's because we want to catch the good leasing season if we are to have vacates. Usually you would expect about two thirds of tenants renewing. And that is what we saw in Q2 is about 65% renewal rate. So when we do have those vacates, we want it to be during the spring and summer season, which gives us the best chance of leasing it quickly and leasing it at its highest rate possible, because that is the seasonally high demand time for renting out properties. And then 66% of those leases were above the forecast to rent, above the pro forma number that we underwrite with. I think when you factor in those that were greater than or equal to, it was about 75 to 80%. So generally there's an outperformance on uh, leasing expectations for the rent values, which is also highly indicative of the season that we're in. All right, next on single family residential fund. So we have about 15 million uh, invested into the SFR fund as a Q2. We launched it uh, around Thanksgiving time of 2023. So we've seen a lot of growth over the last uh, six to eight months. And it's at a it was at a 97% stabilized occupancy rate at the end of Q2. So um, off to a strong start uh, from a occupancy uh, perspective. We signed 13 leases and added eight homes into the fund in the second quarter. Uh, with vacation rentals, uh, continuing to see strong performance, uh, $739,000 of total gross booking revenue across all of our properties, 1,100 ratings at the end of Q2. And I think that's particularly impressive because uh, you know we're very proactive about getting reviews for our properties because we know that social proof is the key to uh, getting great Airbnb bookings. You know, it's like Yelp and restaurants. You got to have high bookings. There's a lot of social proof involved um, in getting these uh, properties as occupied and as revenue generating as they can. 
Uh, and then we had total uh, bookable vacation rentals of 38 at the end of the quarter, 25 total vacation rental markets, and a 4.9 average guest rating for all of our properties, uh, specifically 4.94 for the arrived property management uh, company, which, you know, as you go from 4.9 to 4.92, 4.94, those hundredths of a rating point, they, they're really hard to get. So we're super proud of the ratings that we've gotten so far. And our private credit fund. So we launched this two months ago at the end of May. Uh, by the end of Q2, we had 6.4 million invested in the fund. So a great first month of uh, investment performance with an 8.1% dividend yield uh, in Q2 to be paid out in July. Uh, 15 loans were added into the fund and we have nearly 5,000 investors. So thank you for uh, everyone who has invested so far and would love to uh, continue to see that investment grow over time. And with our investment product focal points. Okay, so within individual properties, we have both vacation rentals and long-term rentals. So within vacation rentals, we had a great quarter two, 70% occupancy um, across the arrived property management portfolio, about 60% for third party. So what we're focused on within vacation rentals is really transitioning into the shoulder seasons well. Different vacation markets have different seasonal highs. So we have a lot of beach properties. Um, so the summer was great. Q2 was um, really good performance. So as we price into August, September, and October, pricing out that calendar, we want to make sure that we are appropriately transitioning the price to make sure that revenue uh, stays optimized as we go into seasonal transition. Similarly, hot markets like Phoenix, like hot, like literally hot, uh, they have lower performance in the summer because it's 115 degrees and it's kind of tough to travel there. But then during the fall time, uh, the, the market really comes alive. So in the same way, we got to transition our pricing up on the shoulder season um, to higher demand. So that's what we're focused on vacation rentals. Uh, with long-term rentals, we're really focused on turns and leasing right now. So there's only a, about another month left of a hot leasing season. We had our heaviest move outs in May and June, intentionally because most of our lease expirations were during that time. So we're contending with micromanaging the turns right now because labor is generally short. There's a lot of activity that happens in the summertime with people moving. Uh, so trade labor is pretty busy right now. So we're really just focused on micromanaging all of those vacancy cycles to make sure that we can get them leased up before the cooling off season uh, starts happening. Within the single family residential fund, we're focused on exploring a lot of new different type of lease structures. There's a certain amount of flexibility afforded to us in the residential fund that we don't necessarily have with individual offerings. So we're exploring different transaction types to bring accretive properties into the fund. Some of those are uh, pre-existing rentals. So with individual offerings, it's a little bit tough for security purposes, um, securities in the sense of the SEC to bring leased properties as individual offerings. So if it was prior operated as a rental, generally it's a no-go for the individual offerings. But in the single family residential fund, that option is available to us. So we're exploring some different portfolios where there's already leased product, as well as some interesting uh, structures like a sale leaseback transaction. So if an owner wants to sell a property but and get some equity out of it, but wants to continue living there, then they could lease it back from us immediately. And then there's different options to repurchase or we could sell that property on a shorter timeline. So lots of options there within the SFR fund and we're exploring those. Within the private credit fund, we're continuing to build out our base of lenders that we're purchasing the loans from. We're also exploring some more B2B type structures of uh, financing inventory for different real estate companies. And generally we've been in a very uh, tight window of risk reward. And what I mean by that is we're being fairly conservative right now to ensure that as our fund grows, we're really managing risk appropriately and we're aiming for like no foreclosures, no defaults, because when your credit fund is smaller, any kind of negative event will impact you disproportionately. As you grow bigger in total volume, total loans that you hold, you can start expanding on the risk reward spectrum to um, try to you know, add some yield that is higher, but maybe a little bit more risk. But for right now, we're playing it pretty safe to uh, make sure that there's no kind of hiccups in the growth of the fund. So that's what we're focused on in private credit and all of our investment products. Um, that was just a real quick high o level overview of all of our products. And now I'm going to bring Jake on at stage to talk about the financials. All right. Thank you, Cameron. So we're going to talk now about how all of that operational performance actually translates into returns for investors. 
And as a recap, there's two types of returns you get when you invest in real estate. There is the dividends, which is the cash flow that's generated from renting a property out, and the appreciation, which is the change in value of the investment. Now, the dividends are considered realized returns because they're actually paid out every month to your arrived account where they can be reinvested or withdrawn. And that appreciation is unrealized because we haven't actually sold the property and distributed the funds. You know, the value of shares that investors own may be higher or lower than that initial investment amount, but ultimately it's an estimate for right now. And the actual appreciation will become realized when we eventually sell the property. The dividends are paid out monthly on around the 25th of the month. And over the last three months, we paid out $1.2 million out to our investors, which brings us up to just shy of $7 million paid out all time. Dividends are a big benefit of real estate because you're able to start realizing some of those returns now, even while you still get to participate in some of the long-term appreciation that comes with investing. Now, we're going to take a look at the rate at which those dividends were earned. So this chart is showing the current annualized dividend yield for the 285 different properties that paid out three monthly dividends during the quarter. This is extrapolating the dividends paid during the quarter to give a full year's annualized picture as a way of analyzing what's going on. Now, there's a lot of confounding variables here. This includes single family residential and vacation rentals, properties with and without leverage, properties in different markets, et cetera. And it's only using the last three payments for each property rather than all of the dividends of properties paid out to date. But this chart can be viewed as a good current snapshot of the arrived portfolio. And it's really reflective of the point in time in which we bought different properties. Now, again, for simplicity, we're only showing the properties that paid three monthly dividends in the quarter. There's another 71 properties that paid one or two monthly dividends and nine that had their dividends paused for the quarter. Generally, we'll start and stop dividend payments for each property, depending on how that property is doing and what kind of cash is needed for operations and what we have available to distribute out to investors. Now, on the far right here, you can see our oldest properties, which are paying among the highest dividend yields right now. These are properties that use mortgage loans at interest, interest rates near 4%. They were located in high cash flow areas in the Southeast. And many properties are on their second or third lease, meaning we've been able to increase the rents and therefore the cash flow since they initially IPO'd to investors. Then you see this group of properties that was purchased about 18 to 24 months ago. We'd started buying properties in more expensive markets that have more of an appreciation focus, like Nashville, Phoenix, and Denver. And this set of properties was purchased in 2022, right as mortgage rates flew from about 3% in the spring to 8% that fall. These properties were still using mortgages, but at higher interest rates. And as a result, they have lower current dividend yields because of that higher interest expense. Most are going through their first lease renewal cycle right now, which is giving us the opportunity to increase rents to the new market rates. And then finally, we see this set of properties that was purchased more recently. As the market shifted, we adjusted our acquisition strategy. So we stopped using leverage on acquisitions, and we still aren't because interest rates are still over 6.5%. We shifted our focus away from those higher appreciation potential markets into cheaper areas that provide for more cash flow now. And as a result, the properties we've acquired over the last year are largely paying dividends in the 3 to 5% range right out of the gate. These properties are all labeled with a strategic refinance candidate tag on their property pages, meaning that we hope to add a mortgage to those properties if rates come down enough for it to make sense. And now we'll shift gears into appreciation. We estimate the unrealized appreciation gains for a property with a share price each quarter. The share price are a combination of the current underlying value of the property and all of the other assets and liabilities that are on the balance sheet of the LLC. The revaluations start after six months for the single family residential and after 12 months for the vacation rentals. And the share prices you see in your portfolio are now accurate, having been corrected yesterday after there was a clerical error when they were first posted last week. Here's a good overall financial performance review for each of our asset types. Now, we, for the individual single family residential properties, we updated the share prices for 261 properties this week and for 24 vacation rentals, with the average share price change for the single family residential properties being slightly positive and for the vacation rentals being slightly negative. And of course, we now also have the two funds that launched over the last year. 
as Cam mentioned, the private credit fund just launched in Q2, and it paid out its first dividend last week at a rate of 8% per year. The single-family residential fund continues to ramp up well. It's been paying out a consistent 4% annual dividend every month since it launched in December. And this quarter, it has the same $9.97 share price that it had last quarter. We'll take a look now at combining the dividends and the appreciation to take a look at the total returns. This is for all of the individual properties, so just the single family residential and the vacation rental. And importantly, this chart is not annualized. So older properties here have had more dividend payments and more time to appreciate. You'll notice that the properties that are within six months of their IPO are hovering around one or 2% on this total returns chart. And that's because there's been no share price revaluation yet. So there's no appreciation returns factored in. And these properties have only paid a handful of dividend payments. On the far right side, we can see again that our oldest properties at two and three years old have among the highest total returns since they were purchased while interest rates were low, they're all leveraged, and they've made a ton of different dividend payments to investors. They've also just had the most time to ride the ups and downs of the market, and so they're more likely to show an appreciated share value. And now in the middle of this chart, we can see the market's been fairly flat over the last 12 to 24 months, with about half the properties showing positive returns. The housing market is all about supply and demand to buy homes. And when interest rates flew up in 2022, people expected to see home prices completely crash with less demand at higher rates. But we didn't see that at all in 2023 and through the first half of this year. The increased interest rates reduced demand, but it also dramatically reduced supply because homeowners with 3 and 4% mortgages didn't want to sell their homes. The result is that the market's been flat, with some areas of the country seeing small gains and others seeing modest declines that we are starting to see signs of the market heating back up. Overall, we're aiming to hold properties for at least five years, giving enough time for the long-term supply and demand imbalances to play out. Now that'll conclude the financial component of our presentation. And I'm gonna pass it off to Ryan to talk a little bit more about what else is new at Arrived and what's coming up soon. All right. Thanks, Jake. And hello, everyone. Let's jump into a little bit about what's new on the Arrive platform and what to look forward to coming up ahead. And then we can jump into Q&A to, to finish up. So thanks for all the questions coming in through chat. Uh, so to start, we talked about the launch of the Arrive private credit fund. Uh, one of the reasons we really felt like now was the time to introduce a real estate backed credit product is just that we've seen such an increase in the interest rate environment over the last two years, now to a 10 year high, which really provides a great investment opportunity and potential um, risk return profile for residential backed credit. We also believe that long term, it's important to be able to offer a diversified option of both real estate equity investments and credit investment opportunities for investors. And so with the, the launch of the private credit fund, investors can now access these high yield focused investments secured by uh, professional real estate uh, renovation and development loans. Uh, so excited to get that out, to get feedback from investors and continue to develop that category of products on Arrived. Next up is a new portfolio that we've designed uh, just to make it easier to see how your portfolio is allocated across different investment products. Um, with the introduction of new credit investment opportunities, we needed to add that into the portfolio, whereas before it was really focused on single family rental and vacation rental individual properties. Um, we've also added in more detailed reporting around funds. And we're excited about this change because it's really the starting point of a lot more updates that we're making to our portfolio, including some new charts and performance reports that, that we're working on just to give investors better visibility into the performance of their portfolio over time. Uh, next is around property tax automation. As always, Arrived is taking care of property taxes and a lot of the backend operations for each property so that investors don't have to worry about that. Um, our team last quarter developed a new internal tool to automate this process. And so that way we can focus more on the investment um, acquisitions and asset management and less operational time on, on managing tax payments. And there's a lot of work that we do behind the scenes to develop 
operational efficiency um, that can benefit you know arrived and therefore investors as we continue to grow the number of assets that we're managing for investors. Next is is a, a similar operational improvement uh, around our annual audits. Um, as part of our SEC compliance, our accounting team organizes hundreds of documents for our auditors each year. And we added a new process to facilitate just a faster um, review of all of these ancillary documents for our auditors. Um, and really, it's just about making sure that we can continue to provide very timely updates, even as the number of investment opportunities continues to grow on a ride. We always want to make sure that we're able to deliver on the commitments that we made to investors on um, our semi-annual and annual SEC filings and audited financial statements on an annual basis. Uh, so excited to to get this done last quarter and continue to you know work on uh, some of these internal operational improvements that are a bit behind the scenes that investors may not see as part of the product that they're experiencing every day, but actually are a really big part of the financial performance and returns that we're able to de deliver for investors as we scale uh, the number of assets that we have under management. Next up, just looking ahead of what we have coming soon, um, we have Face ID as a login for investors who are using our iOS app. Uh, really just to make it easier for authenticating into Arrived and something that a lot of investors have been asking about. Um, we've now gone through our first cycle of the redemption or liquidity program for the SFR fund. That's also available for the credit fund. And so um, that first round of liquidity is coming up now. We have more coming on portfolio reporting um, and just visual visualization of the performance of investor portfolios over time. Um, so some charting and um, tracking around you know, the portfolio performance. Uh, we have new account statements that are underdeveloped now uh, where you'd be able to see just a snapshot of um, your portfolio in your accounts. And then we're also interested for more feedback around what investors would like to see. Um, so I think Corinne will post a poll or a question in chat would love to hear feedback from investors on different types of things that you'd be looking for us to develop over the next few quarters. Um, and yeah, as always, love to hear the feedback directly from investors and use that to inform uh, what we what we spend time on. And so with that, we can jump into Q&A. Um, I'll invite Cameron back on the stage um, and we'll start to look through the uh, the questions that everyone was posting in chat and, uh, and tee things up. Fantastic. Fantastic. Ryan and Cameron, thank you so much for prepared remarks as always, uh, for all the questions in co coming in chat. Absolutely. Fantastic. Jake has moved over there as well. So he'll be able to pick up some of the questions that are coming through. Uh, you'll also notice that Ryan asked a question around what would you all like to see on our roadmap? We truly believe in building for and by each and every investor. So if there's a market an update within the platform, so on and so forth, please feel free to share. You'll notice we have Alexa, our VP and our head of product in here, as well as a whole host of other folks on our engineering team and design as well. So keep the feedback coming our way and we'll go ahead and move over to Q&A right now. So the first one is from Tony. For those properties that lease for less than Performa rents, what drove that decline and what percent below Performa? Cameron, I'll yep. keep that one to you. Yeah, sure. So on Performa rents, for, pro for the properties that did uh, lease for less than that, you know, it's about a quarter, I would say 20 to 25% of, of properties. And there could be a couple of reasons. Some of it is seasonal. So for example, we may have had properties from December or January that were made rent ready, and they just took a while to get leased, you know, to the low season. So we tried dropping rents, seeing if the market bites. And then once you're, as you're going down, you know, the, the rent scale, uh, when leasing season picks up, then those get snatched off kind of the table and keep going from there. So, um, you know, we don't expect that a hundred percent of all leases would be at or uh, above pro forma. Um, I don't know if there's any, you know, company that really is able to achieve that. The market is the market. It's a pretty competitive one. There's a lot of different listings, there's timing issues. So um, there's nothing really that stands out to me as like systemically 
an issue that would result in properties not leasing for um, their pro forma rate. Um, and on average, it would probably be about 50 to $100 below, right? So we're at average about a $2,000 rent. So as you're adjusting rental rates, usually it's not like a $25 bump that'll get you over the hump. Our philosophy is more like make it a material such that the price uh, reduction is an effective one. So when we drop it from the pro forma rates, it's usually in that 50 to $100 range. And then once it does come down, then you know it'll lease out. At some point, people are price sensitive. You never know exactly where that line is. Um, but then you know the market is not perfectly efficient either. So overall, I think that we're still doing a pretty good job of pricing out our rents um, and setting the right expectations. You know, we're not setting them so low such that we're hitting it. I mean, you know, we could lower it and say, hey, we're hitting it 100% of the time. But then that's just kind of su uh, form over substance. So you know, we're really trying to price it accurately. Um, and then are hitting above it about two thirds of the time. And then uh, we're hitting pro forma exactly about 15% of the time. Cause we're, we're always trying to price above seeing what we can get. And then we come down from there. It's a bigger mistake to price it too low than price it too high. You price it too low, it's just snatched off the market. You lose your opportunity for 20 months on average. Um, you price it high and you come down, you just have to be really uh, responsive to what the market is showing you. Uh, and that's how we try to optimize our rents. Absolutely. Thanks for walking through it. Uh, Tony, let us know if there's any other questions there, but very well said, Cameron. All right. Mo moving back over here. A good one from Steven. Looking at the vacation homes you have previously funded, many, uh, maybe most seem to be underperforming both in terms of appreciation, so values declining, and or dividends less than projected. What is different now that we should be that we should feel that upcoming properties like the beatbox should do better? Are you are you being over optimistic? Good questions. Yeah, this this is a, a really good question. So we can dive into kind of expectations for vacation rentals in both a short and longer time frame. So as far as dividends um, go, you know, I think or actually let's let's back up to a concept first that we talked about earlier uh, with vacation rentals and social proof. You know, when you first uh, are looking at a listing on Airbnb, VRBO, you know, if you have, when you start off with zero ratings and zero reviews, it takes a while for those social, for that social proof to accrue. And in order to get some of that first social proof, your pricing is probably going to be lower than what you would expect on a long-term, highly validated listing much like restaurants, right? You know, restaurants will have grand opening specials and they'll have lower pricing and then try to get their menu priced to market over time once they do have the appropriate ratings. So vacation homes are, are very similar in that sense because when you're on those listing aggregators, you don't even know what the address is. You can't do your own research other than what is on the listing. So you have pictures, you have reviews, you have ratings, and that social proof is such a big component of it. So our vacation rental program is still very much in its infancy. Our first ones were launched um, on the late in the later half of 2022. So really, we've had you know not even two years of operating history yet, um, and the majority of our homes have only about a year of operating history. Uh, kind of the convention within the industry says about three years to get to that stabilized um, rate where you do have enough social proof such that the marginal review has kind of, or the incremental review has kind of a marginal effect. So we, we don't believe we're at that point yet. So it's a little bit early for us to say that, um, that they're underperforming in any material way. Um, so the dividends, you know, we do expect them to grow over time. You'll see a graphic on our site that kind of illustrates this concept that we call it the J curve. But, you know, initially there's a bit of a decline because in the beginning phase, we're spending a lot of money on renovations, um, fixtures, furnishing equipment, all the things necessary to make it a nice guest experience. Um, so some of the decline in share value is a result of that. Some of it is just from uh, natural accounting treatment, right, uh, of where you spend the money. So. I don't think that the um, vacation rental, you know, uh, asset class is like impaired in any way. It just takes a longer ramp up time to get to more stabilized performance. To answer your other question now, what gives us confidence, um, say, about the new vacation rentals going forward compared to some of the older ones? I would say one material difference about our new offerings is that they're all internally sourced from a design and implementation point of view. So we have a lot more control over 
kind of what the theming is going to be as well as the execution of it for a more um, like optimal cost. So in the beginning, when we were spreading out a lot of different vacation rentals and using third party management, uh, there was a lot of third parties coming in to design them, execute them. And they're pretty good, but they weren't always, they're, they're not as cohesive as being totally internally sourced. So we have our own in-house designer and um, our own arrived property management team has spent a lot of time in those properties, setting them up, designing them and getting, um, you know, getting them to hopefully that stabilized performance much more quickly. So we do think that there's a pretty big difference between some of our first vacation rentals and the current batch. And there's been a lot of learnings over the last two years. And most of them have, a lot of those learnings have been implemented in the launch of our new ones. So we do think that Beatbox is an awesome property. Um, it's already been live for a couple months and has been having pretty good performance from our perspective. Uh, so that is one big difference uh, for the properties coming online soon. Fantastic. Awesome. I'm going to throw one up here, Cameron, uh, since it's relevant. When we're talking about vacation rentals from San, some of the vacation rental uh, have experienced latency in getting to market. So please explain the root cause of, of that and what operational investment changes have you implemented or evaluated to deal with this? And then I know we have a question in the queue regarding the Vita, so we'll jump to that one next. Yep. <clears throat> so some of the delays are uh, permit related and just labor and design related. These build outs are pretty significant with vacation rentals. So our average asset is somewhere in the neighborhood of around $800,000. And then we spend an additional 150 to $250,000 on uh, renovation work, fixtures and equipment. So that build out schedule can take a long time. And a lot of times there's structural changes as well. So you're applying for permits and that's what's happening with the Vita right now. Um, so we went through a couple of general contractors. It's in a smaller market. So the quality of the labor has been you know, less than ideal. So we've cycled through a couple of general contractors. And then, you know, I think that the Vita in particular is because you're bringing that one up. That's one a little bit more of an outlier case. So unfortunately that property had some safety issues with the deck that we've been having to remediate. And, you know, we did go through a, co a couple of those general contractors to get the right fixes in place. And then the city, you know, demanded more permits and inspections and that can all take a while. So that tends to be the reason for the longer build out of these vacation rentals because you're spending about 25% of the total value in renovations design and then the implementation. Um, so, you know, the everything with vacation rentals does take, tend to take a little bit longer, but that's just the requirement for producing the type of experience we're going for when um, creating this asset class. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks for walking through it. And then Ryan, I just, since we're speaking of, about the Vita, uh, for folks that have invested in it, do you want to give a brief update or what investors might be able to expect? Yeah. As Cameron mentioned, we're now, you know, ongoing in the construction phase. Um, we'll keep investors updated through property history timeline as there's kind of major changes to be had and then email investors um, when there, when there's an update, but we'll follow a similar update process of, you know, all the properties that we have on arrived of email cadence and then the details in the property history timeline. Fantastic. Awesome. Cameron and Ryan, thanks for walking through it. Again, that performance tab is the best place to look. Oftentimes month to month, you might see similar updates. That's, uh, can be standard in the real estate space. There can be not a lot of movement that takes place within 30 days. That said, we will be sure to share as soon as we have another update. They're typically done on a monthly basis for any properties that are not rent ready, uh, whether that is a long-term rental or a vacation rental. All right, moving back over here. A good one from Steven. As a private credit fund is currently yielding about 8.1% based on the term of existing loans and current loan rates, do you anticipate this uh, changing in the near future? Cameron, I'm going to kick to you, but we might have a one-two punch. Ryan, if you have any details as well. Yep. <clears throat> so yeah, the 8.1% is based on the existing loans and current loan rates. Uh, do we anticipate on this changing in the future? Um, not materially. I think that you know, with, sh with interest rates expected to come down, we might see some softening of the rates. But I think that what would... Uh, governs kind of that pricing is the amount of capital available for lending. 
Uh, so I don't see that market changing that much. And in fact, as interest rates come down, I think that there will be a little bit of a shift from the, the large capital providers who are providing the debt financing. Uh, so they're making the loans to you know the flippers and the real estate entrepreneurs. They're going to start shifting some of that capital to real estate equities and start going long again, buying rental properties, starting up their own construction developments. So real est residential real estate capital can shift between debt and equity, depending on the macroeconomic conditions. So um, I think that while rates come down, like you would think that, oh, the natural impact is going to be that uh, the credit is going to get cheaper. I think that is true in some parts of the economy, but I think that uh, we're going to have capital outflows from debt into equity as those rates come down. And that'll help keep the rates higher because the supply of capital available to those lenders is going to come down. Um, and then similarly, as we find more borrowers that we feel comfortable with, more projects across um, different parts of the country and more lenders to work with, we're going to continue to execute the general strategy that we have for the entire um, kind of span of arrived, which is have a diversified pool of assets or lenders that you're picking from and pick the cream off the top because that's basically what we've done. It's why we have 400 properties across 60 markets because we're always just skimming the best ones that we find. So as we expand our lender pools, we're going to continue to do that. So even if interest rates did come down, what we would likely do is expand our lender pool and then just pick a smaller percentage of high, you know, like best performers from those lenders to maintain the yield. Fantastic. Awesome. Stephen, great question as always. I know we were just chatting about that earlier this week. So definitely appreciate you coming today with lots of great questions. Uh, a good one in here from San. How many single family residential and vacation rentals do you plan to offer on average monthly in H2 of 2024? Kim, I'll kick to you. Yep. So I think that, you know, we're on target for somewhere around 30 million per quarter of investments uh, across arrived. And we have both debt and equity offerings. So if we were just to say half, half or so, you know, $15 million of equity per quarter, the average home is about 350 K for the raise. So you would get somewhere around three homes per million dollars of equity investment. So if two quarters worth is $30 million of real estate equity, we might expect somewhere around 90 to a hundred additional homes. I'm sorry, that, that'll be a little bit different depending on the proportion between vacation rentals and long-term rentals, but just to kind of put it in a ballpark range using our average long-term rental, it'd be, you know, around that hundred home mark. Fantastic. Awesome. I know there was lots of questions in there too, around different markets, so on and so forth. And Cameron, I might've missed this when you were chatting. We obviously have the beat box that we've had in coming soon for quite some time as we're awaiting SEC qualification. Do you have an idea if we'll be slowing down or speeding up VR acquisitions as well? Um, so, you know, we're still in a period of time where we are, um, I would say, stabilizing a lot of the operations for the original batch of properties that we've purchased. So another form of acquisitions is also kind of shifting the management. So I expect that we're going to bring more properties from our total VR portfolio in-house um, such that, you know, we'll be uh, introducing those properties. And there's probably going to be, you know, a few marginal acquisitions, but we want to make sure that the existing portfolio is really um, proved out first. So I anticipate fewer acquisitions on VR, but in lieu of that, transitioning some of third-party managed properties to in-house management. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. Moving back over here. Lots of good questions still coming through. Absolutely love to see it. Uh, Ryan, I have one for you from Thomas. Could you please advise us on the timeline of the secondary market for the single family residential properties? So these are for our individual properties like long-term rentals or vacation rentals. Uh, we They would just love an update. I know this has been an extended period of time. It's been around two plus years and folks are wanting to understand you know, what the progress looks like and what, what they can expect moving forward. Yeah, no, this is a, a great question. And um, we've tried to set the expectation from early on that real estate equity investments work best when held for the long term. And that's really what we've built the platform around is supporting you know, the long term commitment to these equity investments. That said, we've we also know that investors have wanted the opportunity to buy or sell on a secondary market. 
Um, and there's a lot that goes into ve to developing that, both from the product per uh, perspective and just developing the, the functionality to buy and sell um, shares from other investors. A key part of that that we built from a platform perspective is just supporting an arrived cash balance. Um, that was a prerequisite to be able to support secondary trading. And so kind of highlights our path along supporting that. Um, we also have to get through the regulatory review process for qualif qualifying a secondary market. And so we're still in that process um, now as well. And so very much we intend to offer liquidity across all arrived products. Um, the secondary market is something that is actively um, you know, in development now, we are also collecting investor feedback um, on the product, especially for investors who have had experience with secondary market, um, secondary markets on other platforms or other assets. Uh, so we can drop a uh, comment in chat, but for anyone who's interested in providing feedback on um, the secondary market, would love to, to chat with you live. Um, and... Yeah, in general, still on our long-term plan to, you know, provide liquidity options for all investments um, on Arrived. And so still working towards that goal for, for investors. Incredible. That's great, Ryan. Thanks so much for walking through it. Uh, and Thomas, we so appreciate you asking great questions. I know we've been chatting a lot on Reddit and with folks uh, behind the scenes as well. Christina Allen, our senior product designer, is going to jump in the chat with how to set up time with her. She's been done an incredible job at gathering any and all feedback to ensure that we're building for and by you when we make this available. So more to come, uh, but let us know if there's any color needed there. A uh, good one in here from Philip. Uh, Cameron, what are your thoughts on the Atlanta market? It sounds like from what Philip had said, it's been a disappointing experience. So would love your thoughts on how this market's performed and maybe what you foresee in the future. Yeah. So in, in general, I think Atlanta as a market as a whole has performed about to expectation. Where I think that it has been disappointing is on the outliers when there are eviction or squatter scenarios. So Atlanta, specifically Fulton County, is kind of the poster child for uh, eviction timelines. So during the pandemic, we know that there was an eviction moratorium across the country. And in Atlanta, it's a very large city. I think it's the eighth or ninth largest metro in the country. So naturally, you're going to have a lot of people that you know, fall into hard times and are unable to pay rent. So when that moratorium is placed, it's not that the evictions aren't allowed to happen, but they don't get processed in that timeline. So basically they're just queuing up with the local county court system to be processed through. So that backlog created an eviction timeline of 12 months. And then, you know, people start to learn to play the system and it kind of becomes urban legend of what you can do and you know social media helps propagate messages so there was a fairly uh large you know number of cases of kind of professional squatting um and just people knowing that it's better for them to ride out an eviction timeline that could span 12 months compared to doing the right thing getting out of the property because like they didn't have to so i think that that's really the you know if there's a disappointing part about out at the Atlanta performance, it's when that happens, it tends to be of pretty big magnitude. So there's a couple of our properties that have fallen, um, you know, kind of prey to those types of practices. Um, and it's unfortunate, but overall the Atlanta market has experienced about 4% annualized rent growth, 30 days on market. So it's performing on the whole, like we think it should across 29 properties. But there's two or three outliers that are just really tough to deal with. So certainly those investments themselves have been disappointing. But the market as a whole, um, I think it's still good. And we plan to continue to invest. But kind of as a testament to our uh, our structure of how we invest and like where we keep full-time employees and where we don't, we stopped buying in Atlanta about 18 months ago. And I think there was one property that we got as an off-market deal from one of our partners that was like, okay, this is too good to pass up. But other than that, we haven't bought there in 18 months. So we can just kind of turn on and turn off uh, acquisitions as we see fit. And until that backlog really clears down to something more reasonable, um, like two to three months, like normal evictions would take, uh, we're kind of pausing Atlanta. I think there's other good markets in Georgia 
that have been good for us, Augusta, Savannah, et cetera. So we're not um, kind of changing our investment thesis, but it's just a timing issue for something very specific to Atlanta, which is like a local court system. Um, so once we get over kind of that saga and that period of history, uh, we could probably go back to investing in Atlanta. Fantastic. And Cameron, I think there's a good one in here from Jean, just to follow up on it as we're thinking about screening process. How do you better screen for tenants in those circumstances or local environments? Obviously, we know we've seen it on the news. Things are changing mm -hmm. daily. New tactics are out there. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure you have more color here. Yep. So in terms of tenant screening, uh, at the beginning of the year, we did a larger overhaul to our underwriting standards with our property management partners. So we raised credit scores and security deposit requirements uh, just to make sure that those that did come into the houses are more financially qualified. Um, you know, nothing's perfect. Even somebody with an 800 credit score can go into eviction, right? So uh, as, as we said in the beginning of the message, past performance is no <laughs> indication of future results. With that said, um, underwriting standards is an area that we've improved, as well as on our uh, last couple of lease cycles, we asked our property managers to not put on the um, kind of auto showing locks where you can just submit a code, put a 99 cent deposit and like do a self tour. That's how you get some squatters. So we move to live agent showings in that market. So that way, the only people that would have access to the property would be the ones who are going to go tour the property with an actual agent. So that's one way that we've also mitigated it. Now we can't, you know, our property managers can't discriminate. They have to follow fair housing rules. So, um, you know, whoever's qualified and meets the underwriting standards, they get in. But we did adjust the standards and we did remove auto showings and locks to uh, reduce the chances that squatters get into the property. Fantastic. And obviously we know, Cameron, and we always recommend diversification as a whole. There's it tends to be always outliers in any investment that we make. So we tend to see folks that are invested in different markets, different asset classes, offering so on and so forth to minimize that risk there. Obviously, our team is continuing to iterate daily. But these uh, obviously these one off occurrences can take place at any time. All right, moving back over to the queue here. Let's see what we have. Uh, one from Herman. Can you elaborate a bit on arrive sentiment of the Albuquerque market? I saw one property available for investing and it's intriguing me to invest. Yeah, I think the Albuquerque market is a nice play on the southwest part of the country in general. The other two larger markets, uh, Phoenix and Las Vegas, that are kind of very synonymous with the southwest market, they're great markets, um, but they're expensive. You know, they're they're not as affordable as they you know were you know, once known maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, so we like the Southwest in general. I think property taxes are low. I think that there's good tourism markets. I think that um, in general, it's a desirable place for a lot of people to live despite the hot weather. You know, there's actually a lot of people that like that. Um, <clears throat> Albuquerque is kind of a play on all of that, but at cheaper prices. So a lot of times you try to go where there's less competition, there's less institutional competition. So every major public real estate company, they're in Phoenix, they're in Las Vegas. There's a lot of supply going up. So the competition there is pretty stiff. And in general, if you look at our market spread and where we're buying assets, it's it's finding the areas that have good macro um, elements to it. There's investment, there's population growth, there's jobs. But then we're looking for low cost of living. You know, a lot of the Southeast is like that. And then in the other part of the country, we find Albuquerque to be, have similar traits as those markets. Um, so that's why we're investing in Albuquerque right now. Would like to invest more into Phoenix, would like to invest uh, in open in Las Vegas. I lived there for 10 years before moving to Seattle. So I know it's a great market, but it's just, it's a timing thing with price right now. So we prefer to place our bets in Albuquerque uh, as kind of a derivative play on all of those macro forces going on, but at that low cost of living. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks for walking through it, Cameron. I think there was a little bit of a follow-up there. Aren't rents super low in New Mexico? Do you have feedback on that? Yeah, depend. It, it, they can be. Yeah, for sure. And I think that when, you, when you're looking at low rents, you have to look at it relative to the purchase price. So I would say that the purchase price to rent ratios are much better in Albuquerque at all levels of the spectrum. But there's also areas that are 
higher rent that fit more of the profile that we've been buying. So you can still find $2,000 and $2,200 rent properties for anywhere from $280,000 to $350,000. It's actually very similar to Tennessee, to Atlanta. So I don't find that the rent levels are low. They can be. There is cheap housing anywhere that you look, and perhaps there's a higher proportion of low cost housing in Albuquerque, but it's what we really look at is kind of the cash flow relative to the purchase price. So in effect, how much cash flow are you getting per dollar of purchase price that you're spending? And for Albuquerque, it looks better to us than it does uh, Phoenix and Vegas. Fantastic. Awesome. Glad we could group that one together there. Uh, let's move back over. Ryan, I'm going to kick this next one to you. I mentioned earlier that we've had the beatbox and coming soon for quite some time, but it is an active vacation rental. So Steven's asking, will, the, will you get performance info on the beatbox when it gets offered? Yeah, that's a great question. So the beatbox is in preparation now to be offered to investors. And um, part of the way that it works with each property that we make available to investors is it goes through an SEC filing and review process. And then once it's qualified, we can make it available to invest. With the beatbox, uh, we've been waiting longer for um, basically releasing the property to investors. And that's allowed us to get it through final construction, get it booking ready on Airbnb and start actually generating bookings. Um, so we have great visibility into, you know, the performance of the property. Um, and we have a financial section on each property before it's launched that, you know, highlights what we believe could be the financial performance of that property. So that's what will be available to investors. I think the added information um, specific to the beatbox is just that investors can see the actual Airbnb listing, the final completed designs and aesthetic of the property, the initial ratings and reviews of the property, um, the fact that it's already a guest favorite, some of those things that provide early indication of what's the guest response and what, you know, could we expect um, long term. And it's really about, you know, each each new property in the vacation rental segment goes through this phase where it's building its brand in that market on Airbnb, in a sense, it's getting the uh, sort of social proof of um, the ratings and reviews that give comfort to new potential travelers to book that property. Um, and that's really what helps with the, um, the revenue performance, the occupancy and making sure that it's booked up throughout the year. Um, that said, it's still very early in the cycle for Beatbox. So it's not that we have substantially more information than we might usually have for investors. Each vacation rental property goes through this early phase of you know, generating bookings and reviews and using that to generate the long-term revenue potential for the property. And these are very long-term investments, five to 15 years. And so while we do have, you know, this early look into the performance and the um, early results have been good, it's still a, you know, five to 15 year investment to really you kind of prove out the long-term performance. And so I think investors should be really mindful of that, especially um, when they're evaluating, you know, the, the investment. Absolutely, Ryan. So well said. Um, I know, Cameron, you were talking about earlier too, essentially all the things we're doing to operationalize and increase those efficiencies. So previously we were releasing vacation rentals that had uh, more work to be done before they came rent ready. So let's say folks were investing in them six months before they were rent ready. So one of the strategic and operational efficiencies we've done is make sure all those properties are uh, ready to go before folks are investing in them. So not to say that's what it is for all the properties moving forward, but it is a strategic move uh, to have those ready to go when folks are investing in them. All right, moving back over. And Jake, thanks for helping out in the queue and Jeff and all the other folks from Arrived. Uh, one from Bill, any updates on the trend in new laws restricting companies from buying single family uh, private properties? Cameron, I'll kick this one to you. Um, yeah, so just so everybody's kind of on the same page here, I would say within the last six months, nine months or so, there's been uh, a couple of different bills, some at the federal level, some at the state level that speak to um, who can own what kind of homes in what proportion. And I think that there's you know, talk of trying to limit the amount uh, of investment purchases that can be made by any single entity for the purpose of um, making sure that an the general population has access to housing and compete. Um, and what I would say is that I, I don't think I've heard too much um, 
evolution of this in the last couple months. I think that, you know, the news cycle has primarily been on just politics and election related stuff, a little bit less on real estate. So I haven't really heard many updates about it. Um, but I'd say that in general at Arrived, uh, we're not as concerned about that legislation as maybe um, some of the larger public REITs are that uh, are probably more within the crosshairs of that type of legislation. So you think to any of the large uh, rental companies that are public, they own pro portfolios of 50 to 100,000 properties. There's a lot of hedge funds and private equity firms also that own multiple thousands of properties. Um, the majority of our properties on Arrive, 404 of them to be exact, are individual offerings. So there's one company with one property. So our model is generally not um, the subject of this type of legislation. Uh, there are some parts of that of those proposed laws and I, and I want to emphasize the word proposed because they're not actually law yet they're just random proposals from different um, members of Congress uh, so you know we have a fund and they may be subject to the rules because the SFR fund for example the single family residential fund there's 39 properties in there right now some of the legislation has proposed that capping at 100 properties and you know to us that's okay if we have a fund of 100 properties then you know, we're pretty good at starting new securities creating new companies to hold different properties so if that did come into play there's a lot of very large companies that would be very affected by this legislation for us we don't think that we're really the target of this and even if uh, our activities kind of fall under that purview we're really good at kind of dissecting portfolios into small atomic units. So I, I don't anticipate that we would have much trouble navigating the legislation, but it would probably have a big industry impact. So, you know, we'd definitely be on the lookout for that. Uh, but I don't think that we're as affected by um, this proposed legislation, if any of it even passes, than larger companies. Absolutely. And I, I obviously Cameron and Ryan were doing everything on our end to monitor daily if there were any changes there. I think usually the question that follows is what can I do as an investor? So we always recommend reaching out to your um, local local folks or local um Law enforcement is not the right word. So I'm just thinking of words there, but we have a letter essentially that you can send to folks uh, to address this. So feel free to ping support at arrive.com. I'd be happy to provide that for you. Our VP of legal created that. All right, moving back over to the queue here. One in from Nick. What headwinds does the team expect in the real estate market in the next six months to a year? Cameron, yep. Yeah. So as far as real estate market headwinds, you know, I think that interest rates are such a big topic when it comes to talking about macro with real estate. It really dictates affordability. It dictates the supply and demand dynamics. So I think one of the headwinds um, is increasing supply for certain parts of the country. You know, we've had high interest rates in our economy and high mortgage rates for close to two years now. So, you know, as as that extends out in time, there's less and less buyers in the market that can afford to sustain the mortgage at that rate. So I think, you know, the supply has been building up slowly and we've re we're really starting to see it in 2024 in the country as a whole. Now, asterisk, asterisk different markets are going to behave very differently. So we're thinking, you know, we tend to go to markets that are low cost of living, but growing in population. And we think that's the generally the recipe that's going to be leading to price appreciation. So in a macro sense, I think that supply is slowly building up and that's going to be a headwind on prices overall. And maybe one non-intuitive factor of, of a headwind is actually interest rates coming down. So the reason why I say it's not, it's not intuitive is because as interest rates come down, prices become more affordable in a sense. Um, but that's just kind of a proxy for supply and demand. I think that there's been a lot of sellers who've been deferring selling their properties because uh, what's called the interest rate lock effect. They may have a mortgage at 4%. And if they sold their home, the mortgage in most cases does not travel with them. There's some exceptions, but just assume that for the most part, people cannot transfer their mortgages from property to property. So 
when their interest rate is high, they're not going to sell their existing property and substitute into something that's more expensive. But as those rates come down, the the rate differential is less and less pronounced. So that actually may increase supply in the market. So I don't think that it's going to drive prices down in any sense, but I, I do think that it creates this kind of like gridlock on the price where as rates come down, things become more affordable. There's more buyers, but then there's also more um, supply in the market as well. So I think that's probably like the most major headwind to me and probably followed secondarily by pseudo recession, recessionary effects. We see weakening in um, employment levels. I think that, it, you know, pe people have different opinions on whether we've been in a recession or not and like whether they trust the macroeconomic data and job reports and things like that. So um, it could be argued that we could be in a slight recession. And certainly you would expect that from two years of high interest rates to try to cool down the economy. Cause that's exactly why the fed does it is they try to cool an economy down when it's overheated. So prices come down and everything's a little bit more affordable for the average person. Um, a consequence of cooling down the economy by lowering rates is softer employment, softer economic activity. So to the extent that we could see lingering recessionary effects, even as rates come down, that could be another headwind as well. And I would probably rank that as the second headwind behind um, just a general increase in supply for various reasons. Absolutely. Wow. That's awesome, Cameron. I appreciate you walking through it. Also, I saw you were trying to help me in chat when I was fumbling my word. So <laughs> I meant to say local representative is who you can reach out for the question that we answered just before. Uh, so thanks for keeping me honest there. I might need to get a, another cup of coffee post webinar. All right, moving back over to the chat. I think we have a few more here. Cameron and Ryan, are you too comfortable staying on the line to answer questions post time? Let's do it. All right, awesome. We have Jake Webb here today, one of our longest investors on Arrived, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, Jake shared, it seems like property values or unrealized potential gain profit are not shown as, as high visibility items in the platform from a total value perspective. Is that a result of the current state of the market or, uh, for example, a devaluation? Maybe I can speak to this one from portfolio design because we've been making a lot of improvements to just the information available on the portfolio and making it easy to see what you own across different assets. And then we've added secondary clicks to get more information. So if you have a portfolio that's diversified across, let's say, single family residential properties, vacation rental properties, and the private credit fund. You could see each of those individual assets listed, and then you can click into those assets in the portfolio to get more detail on the underlying performance. Um, in that detail section, I think we're trying to make it more obvious that there's a lot more information in that table available to investors, but investors may have to scroll horizontally to get to that information. Um, I think one of the other ways that we hope to make it easier to kind of see this data is with some of the uh, visual charts that we're planning to add in a next follow-up to the portfolio view. Um, but I don't think that, you know, we haven't changed the information that's available, but it is possible that it is the detailed information is on a second click or needing to scroll to see something like a share price change for an individual property. Um, and so that's something to be mindful of. We're trying to do a lot, you know, to make the portfolio have depth of data, but also have kind of quick insights at the top level for investors who just want kind of a quick update. Um, and so I think that's probably more of, you know, what's happened is just things are moving around. Um, if you have specific feedback on something you think is missing that you either were seeing before that you can't find now or that you'd like to see, uh, please reach out um, and let us know and we'll kind of see either it did it move or is it something that um, we'd look to add for investors. Um, but yeah, that's, I guess, in general, kind of how we're thinking about the portfolio. Um, and, you know, I know that I mentioned this um, in the, the prepared remarks in here as well, but I'll just reiterate, I think that the you know, adding in the the visual performance, kind of the charting over time, we hope will help with this. And we're planning to allow investors through that chart to see a split of your performance over time. What portion of that is made up by contributions, you know, new investments that you're making, property value, uh, appreciation, and dividends. And so it's very clear to see kind of how those things add up to your current portfolio value. 
so that's in the works now. Um, I'm excited for investors to to see that um, as kind of a quick snapshot. Uh, but ultimately, the data should be there behind that second click if you click the individual asset um, in your portfolio. Absolutely. Ryan, thanks for walking through it. Uh, for folks on the line, I hope you've noticed a theme or a, a lot of questions that we're asking for feedback. Uh, the only way we continue to grow is if we're building uh, within the platform on things you would like to see and make it as digestible as possible, whether it's in your current investments or new offerings moving forward. So like Ryan and then Alexa in the chat just said, appreciate the feedback always. So keep it coming our way. And then as Ryan mentioned in prepared remarks on that product roadmap, we have a lot to come. So stay tuned, uh, but definitely keep sharing the feedback as we continue to iterate. All right, moving back over, a good one in here from San. Also with regards to debt offerings, what is the rationale to gear towards longer term investments so nine months to a year rather than six months? Cameron, I'll kick that to you. Yep. Yeah, so uh, our general range of term lengths on, on the notes that we're purchasing into the credit fund range from six to 24 months. It could go as high as 36 months too if you do ground up construction, of which we plan to have some debt offerings that are ground up construction, but we want to make really sure that the, bo the borrower has a very good track record of doing it before we start originating those. So, you know, the difference between six months versus nine months to a year within this space, uh, it's it's not vastly different. Most notes, you know, they could be for uh, six months, you know, as the stated term length, most are going to be at uh, index to a year. Uh, so it really just kind of depends on the borrower's plan and how they're able to execute that determines how quickly does the credit fund get paid back on that loan. I think I've seen some six month loans where it's specifically a bridge loan where it's not a fix and flip loan. Basically, it's a lease up loan. So that way uh, somebody can finance the property, get it rented out. And then the the short term loan, you know, the bridge loan that we have for six months, it would get replaced by a 30 year standard kind of uh, rental investment uh, mortgage that the borrower would take out. Most loans, though, that we're purchasing have a stated term length of a year. And just to give you an idea of kind of what does the borrower do in that time frame? So probably four to six months, they're renovating the property. And then from six months to a year, depending on you know how the market is, they're trying to sell that property. Uh, so the average payback is going to be somewhere in the range of eight to nine months. Uh, but there's not a material difference between six and 12 from our perspective. It's, uh, you know, the shortest I've seen is six. And that's for a bridge loan with no rehab. Fantastic. Awesome. Looks like we have a few more here. Uh, the, a good one from Don. Are you leveraging a single property insurance company nationwide? Cameron, I'll kick that to you. Yes, we are. So we have a master policy that all of our rentals are subject to. So both on the long-term rental side and the vacation rentals, we have the same insurance provider that really gets best pricing for insurance policies, as well as the best coverage. Uh, so master policies are easier for companies to administer rather than single one-off policies. You can imagine that there's a lot of overhead in dealing with, you know, let's take our 404 individual properties. You could deal with 404 different individuals, different servicing statements, different accounts, different account representatives, pricing plans, or you could deal with one investment group that has a master policy covering 400 properties with a single layer of administration. So that's how you kind of get best pricing as well as uh, some commercial terms that are available to larger policies, such as um, the rent payment. You know, one of one of the features of our long-term rentals and vacation rentals is that uh, we would be compensated lost rents if we have to exercise any claim. And we have gotten lost rents before on our insurance claims. So that master policy is really a an efficiency vehicle that is available to a larger enterprise that may not be available to individual uh, purchasers or investment or individual property owners. Uh, so that's why we go through that type of policy. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for walking through it. Don, great question. San also said, thanks. So it's market driven, market driven pretty much. Any feedback on that remark? Um, market driven, which part? 
I believe, Son, I'm not sure if you were responding to a previous answer from Jeff in here, but they had just mentioned in chat, Cameron, that it's that driven by the market. So I'm not sure where that one landed. Yeah, um, maybe some clarification there, but then I'm happy to answer the question um, with a little more clarification of the debt investment. Oh, Mark. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. So the amount of time that a loan is outstanding, yeah, that is probably going to be a market driven uh, factor. One, on how fast the borrower is able to renovate the project. And then two, how quickly are they able to exit? So hopefully, you know, if we're doing our debt underwriting correctly, a big part of what we look at is, is the property and the project a match for the neighborhood that they're putting it in? You wouldn't want to put a $2 million house in a $500,000 neighborhood. And then vice versa either you wouldn't want to you know do a a, a really low-end project in a, in a nicer neighborhood uh so yes we it is primarily driven by those market dynamics fantastic awesome thanks for helping me out in the chat son and then walking back through it cameron appreciate it great feedback in there all right robert asked a great question uh they said why are dividends dropping on some single family residential properties that were leased above the estimated price I've been continually occupied, no evictions, no lease breaks. Is there a place to see cash flows for properties owned? Uh, and Robert, I know you mentioned the regional in particular. We'd have to take a look at the data there, but we're happy to provide more details around some of these questions that you've asked. So Cameron, I will kick it over to you. Yep. So in our most recent quarter, I think we paid out an average dividend of 4%. So that is in line with our expectations of the portfolio as a whole. We often say that we uh, would expect about half the return to come from dividends, half to come from appreciation. And we give a general range of about 6 to 10%. So um, from our perspective, the portfolio as a whole has been delivering on its dividends. Individual properties can vary a lot, though, and we did make a recent change to our like kind of the mechanics of how we distribute dividends, which is why you may see some that are lower. So here's an example of one of those policy changes. When a property goes vacant, then we stop paying out the dividend uh, because there's no rental income coming in. One of the points of confusion for some of our investors was not really understanding how we got to the dividend amount. And they would say, hey, wait a minute, my property's vacant. How is it that I'm getting rental income coming in? Um, so you know, in the beginning, we had this perspective that we're trying to smooth out the investment for people, keep dividends stable and kind of take like what the average performance would be over time and pay that out. And that was proven to be pretty difficult because every property is going to have different issues. Um, some may perform extremely well um, in which there's no vacancy and, it's, and that's an easy way to pay out. Other properties, they have multiple vacancy cycles or they may have repairs and maintenance that made it not possible to really pay out that average stabilized dividend without having some disruption to the cash flows. So we take the approach now that when a property is vacant, we just, we're going to suspend the dividend. And then once it gets leased up, we're going to continue the payout schedule. So it'll mirror much more closely the anticipated cash flows and economics of monthly rent coming in and monthly expenses going out. Part of it was also that we switched our dividend cadence to monthly from quarterly. And that was a big change for us that allowed us to take on this, um, this different perspective of, okay, let's pay out rents when it's coming in and let's not pay them out. So we think it's better cash management and it better mirrors the experience of what the underlying operations are. So I think that you'll see that there are going to be a higher percentage of properties that probably pay zero in some months. But then you'll also see that when it does get leased up, you'll be seeing dividends that are higher than the 4% average. You might see five, sixes, and sevens because that reflects rental cash coming in without having to pay out the expense profile. So I think that what you're seeing is not necessarily fundamental changes in performance, but just different cadences of how things are paid out. Fantastic. Awesome. It was a great question, Robert. Uh, feel free to ping us to supportedrive.com if you want us to look at any specific properties, more than happy to. Uh, I'm going to give it at roughly like 15 more seconds here. If I missed any of your financial related questions in the chat, please keep me honest. I uh, would love to make sure those are answered. Uh, Ryan and Cameron, we'll start with Ryan first. Any closing remarks before we shut our virtual doors? I'll just say thanks to everyone for for joining for the for the webinar for all the great questions and for event investing alongside us um thank you corinne cameron and jake and all the arrive team in chat just helping us uh be able to answer everyone's questions and and run through the content today yep likewise um 
blown always blown away by the investor engagement. Um, we'll make a plug for the private credit fund here in the background on my TV with the uh, the shiny first dividend there of eight point one percent dividend yield. Uh, this this investment product is particularly you know a favorite of mine, close to my heart. I had a lending business in Las Vegas in early twenty tens era, um, and it's a it's an investment product that I think really helps uh, solve some more goals than just getting high returns. I think it really helps with improving the housing stock in the country. It allows real estate entrepreneurs and developers to get the velocity needed to improve the housing stock across the country. A lot of estimates um, from different research publications estimate that there's a mismatch between the number of households that need housing versus what the existing stock is. And that number is placed around two to $5 million. So the, the private credit fund is really a great vehicle to both get in great investor returns, as well as contribute to helping um, the supply issues out in the market. You know, every, every loan is helping bring supply onto the market. So we think it's a, it's a great cause. It's a great investment product and um, it's a personal favorite of mine. So I encourage everyone to check it out. Absolutely. David said, here, here. Uh, I know myself and a lot of other arrivers and investors could listen to Cameron talk about the private credit fund for hours on end. Uh, huge kudos to you, Cameron, on all the work behind the scenes and your personal affinity for the private credit fund as a whole. I know it relates to a lot of the work that you've done uh, previously as well. There was one, I, I'm going to throw this up here from Francis, will that 8.1 stay stable? Well, we're, we're definitely aiming it um, to mm -hmm. stay stable around that area. Um, we're always looking for different risk return opportunities as well. And as, as I stated in my prepared remarks earlier, right now, I think we're being conservative in the sense of optimizing towards avoiding defaults, avo like putting a premium on good borrowers. Because when your fund size is smaller, any sort of hiccup default puts a big hamper on it. You're not large enough yet to absorb any sort of loss. You contrast that with a really large fund and you start getting into kind of insurance concepts where you, the law of large numbers start taking over. So you would then expect some defaults, but you can also start pushing for a higher reward too. So, you know, I think where we are on the risk reward spectrum is an appropriate level. I do think that there are opportunities to find higher yields. So, you know, depending on how the pricing goes for our kind of average investment within our within our core buy box right now that'll inform us of whether we need to take more risk and reach for more reward and find the best way to do that to maintain the yields or if we can continue to um, play a very defensive safe game to deliver the yields absolutely yeah great question francis as a perfect way to close this out i'll also make a note too uh, but for both fund offerings, so that's the private credit fund that Cameron's talking about, and for the single family residential fund, investments made by July 31st, which is tomorrow, will qualify for the expected dividend around September 25th. So just wanted to share that detail really quick. Cameron, we have one more. Are you okay taking it? And then we'll we'll move from there, I promise. Yeah, sure <laughs> okay. One second here. There's one from Steven. If you don't have defaults, defaults on it, would the yield go up as you have excess reserved? Yeah, it's it, it, we try to we we aim to have no a pre, no share price change. So like pegging it to ten dollars. So to the extent that we are outperforming and that there aren't defaults, there would be a uh, potentially excess cash to pay out. Depends on the investment mix of the underlying loans, like what the yield is uh, overall on it. But yes, you know we do account for credit loss reserves. So to the extent that there aren't credit losses there would be excess cash to be able to try to boost that dividend. Fantastic. All right. I think we cruise through all of them. So Ryan and Cameron and Jake, thank you so much for prepared remarks and then all the work and answering the Q&A that came in. Uh, for all the Arrive team, thank you for your all the... Uh, engagement in chat as well. And then we wouldn't be here without all the investors that were walking alongside. So thank you for joining today, asking great questions, sharing your feedback. Uh, again, we are building forum by you. So it's imperative that we continue to engage with you all. So if you have topics on webinars that you would like to see in the future, feel free to share in chat or feel free free to ping support at arrive.com. You can also use the chat function in the bottom right hand corner of arrive.com. But I hope you have a great rest of your day and happy investing. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye all. Thanks everyone. See ya.